the people who are the formal leaders should exercise just enough leadership. They should be listening to everybody else in the place because there are wonderful ideas all over the organization. Presumably somebody in Ikea listened to that worker who had to take the legs off the chair. That's what I mean by uh, just I guess the, the prime example was IBM, though, for just enough leadership in your case. That was an example I used of Gerstner, yeah, where, where after one or two years, I forget what it was, he told the press, you're not going to get this vision thing out of me. In other words, he's not ready to, to consolidate a vision for IBM because he was still learning and he came from another industry. I'm always suspicious of people who parachute into one industry from another industry. They're fine if, if, if they can learn, if they're capable of learning, give themselves the time for learning. When Fiorina joined Hewlett Packard, she announced the day she arrived that she had her strategy. It's kind of like, whoa, wait a minute. She's never been in the company, never been in the industry, and she's announcing her strategy on the day of arrival? Gerstner was smarter than that. Uh, Fiorina, I think, was an exception, because I think women are usually smarter than that. It's usually men who screw up that one. Um, but, but, um, but Fiorina, I think, was an exception. So now she's going to be a politician and maybe even president of the United States, she'll be probably just as good as George W. Bush. That is, that is a clear vote of confidence. Thank you for that one. Another MBA. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I we should could, add that some of my best friends are MBAs. But <laughs> well, we could just stop the conversation here and close the uh, business schools and we would be better off, I guess. No, no. No. No, no, no. Must, <laughs> mustn't do that. All my friends will be out of work. <laughs> yeah, but the offset of that unemployment would be nothing compared to the greater good of society. Well, no. The idea is to convert the business schools. <laughs> to something else. You're so surprised. <laughs> you never expected. Uh, to convert the... <laughs> never. To convert the business schools to another model of management development, management education and management development, which is, it's okay, the, the, the MBA stuff around the functions is fine. If you want to learn marketing, finance, fine. BCom is great because they're creative and don't have many pretensions. So, so that works fine. But, but, but in the management development part, whether it's degree programs or not, number one, you only bring people into those programs who are managers, okay? And you leave them in their jobs. You leave them in their jobs. You don't take them out of their jobs, uh, rip them out of their jobs to be, to be uh, educated. You leave them in their jobs so they can be go back and forth between the concepts in the, in the schools and the, and the experience on the job, and they can bring the concepts back to work, and they can bring the experience into the classroom. And you, and you get fantastic uh, things. I was just doing this yesterday with a, with a group of, in our EMBA program with Ashley Sane McGill, uh, doing with a group of about 40 people. And, and, and once you get them going, and once you get them sharing experience, they're amazing. So you put them in round tables in a flat classroom so they can spend at least half their time sharing their experience with each other, okay? And learning from their own experience. So, you know, at Wharton, uh, which is either the top rank or one of the top ranked uh, business schools uh, anywhere, uh, they boast, I, I looked about a year ago, and it was on years earlier and still on a year or two ago, they boast that in the Wharton EMBA, you get exactly what you get in the Wharton's famous regular MBA. Now think about that. They're boasting that we take people with 10 and 20 years of managerial experience, and we can't do any more for them than we do for people who have no or little experience. They're boasting about this, you know? And, I put that in my book years ago. I guess nobody at Wharton ever read it, so they keep doing it. So, which, which just shows you how much interest there is in the business schools in being introspective. But, but, uh, so, so you bring in people who are managers, the way EMBA programs do, the way our international masters in practicing management does, and our healthcare equivalent uh, program does. You bring people in who, who have lots of experience, you sit them at round tables in a flat classroom, we drop in our pearls of wisdom as professors, we do have things to say, but you turn it over to them around the tables and let them run with it on their agendas. Can I make use of this? Can I do something about this? Yesterday in the EMBA program, I talked about conundrums of managing. For example, um, how do you... Uh, uh, 
how do you stay in touch as a manager when the very fact that you're, that you're a manager disconnects you from what you're managing? Yesterday you were a salesperson or a production or designer. Today you're managing that. You're no longer doing it. So how do you stay in touch when you're no longer doing it? That's one of the conundrums. There's lots of them. And I turned it over to them and said, why don't you discuss these conundrums in terms of your own job? And they went on. It was very hard to stop them. So, so it's so simple. Uh, you, bring them, you, you bring in real managers, you bring them close to the job so that they come for a few days at a time or a, few, a couple of weeks at a time, and you give them a chance to reflect on their own experience and learn from it and, and pursue the, the action consequences of what they're learning. What, what am I going to do about this when I go back to work on Monday? Okay. Uh, and then we can talk about this later. Then we develop what we call coachingourselves.com which is another program where we took the whole kit and caboodle and we dropped it into the organizations themselves. No classroom in that case. So the professor comes in through topics that, are, that, are, that you download and, and groups simply form in companies, download these topics and discuss them among themselves and drive major change in their companies. And it's quite remarkable how it's working. We started out by saying it's really a matter of changing culture. Um, to what extent HR people can drive that within their own enterprise. Because if it's not coming from the leaders, it has to come from somewhere. Whether or not you're going for your, your own model, the, the one you are advocating, or anything that resembles a community-based organization. Well, in, in, is there a responsibility in, for the people in this room to say, yeah. hey, we can change things and we're not going to wait for the leader to say, that's the way? Well, in coaching ourselves, for example, we're working largely with HR people who, are, who see themselves, uh, H, H, uh, uh, HB people, human yeah. being people, who, who, are, who see themselves as the champions of changing the culture and bringing that sense of community to the organization. We're not dealing exclusively with those people, but we're dealing largely with those people. They're a special breed of HR people. They're the ones who really want to do something different and really want to create this sense of community and not do the usual executive program, things where people go off, have a wonderful time, come back, uh, get hit with the work and scratch their head and say, now what do we do? In our, in our, so we're dealing a, lo a lot with the HR people. Uh, um, uh, Lufthansa has been in our International Masters in Practicing Management, our IMPM program, for 15 years. It's probably a record. They've sent teams to that program for 15 years. Lufthansa has one HR person who looks after the people who come to this program, okay? And, and, and what, what Lufthansa is really keen about, and this was an idea that came out of a meeting we had with our people and people from Lufthansa and people from Rio Tinto last year, where, where we started to look at uh, um, how we can have impact, what we're calling impact. How can the people in the classroom bring their ideas to the workplace for impact? How can they drive change? And it occurred to us that even in a Lufthansa where they come as a team, they go back as individuals and they're alone when they go back. So we said, we came up with this idea of, of it was actually uh, Danielle Houdon from Rio Tinto and uh, Dora Coop from McGill and so on came up with this idea. Why don't we ask the managers in the program to designate an impact team? People they work with, maybe their own reports, maybe people in their own unit, maybe colleagues around them. Designate an impact team and then every time you come back from a module in the program, your team, you start debriefing your team on what you learned and they become the vehicle not only for you to spread your learning but for you to spread the action because they can act together to say, you know, that was a great idea you had in class and, and we can see how we can make a change in our unit or even in the whole company. So, and, and then we're using the Coaching Ourselves materials. For example, if I do something on strategy as a learning process in the class, they can take the Coaching Ourselves topic called crafting strategy, do that with their own people so they replicate what they learned in the classroom as a way to bring that learning to those people and then spread it through the company. Right now we're on our way, Monica Redden is sitting here from Australia, uh, a number of us are on our way to Kenya to see, we have a healthcare program called the International Masters uh, for Health Leadership 
uh, which is very similar to the uh, business program, but for healthcare. And we're on our way to Africa to see if we can work with the Africans in, in Kenya, particularly on scaling up uh, the idea of building a management infrastructure using the IMPM or IMHL design with the coaching ourselves design. Uh, and we see that as a way to really change because coaching ourselves in particular, very inexpensive. You can do it with huge numbers of people and that could spread throughout Africa and have a gigantic effect on management development in Africa. Uh, when you're talking about having impact, uh, I hear empowerment, uh, making sure your managers, workers uh, mm -hmm. feel that they're empowered. Mm -hmm. But for that to happen, you have to have trust because you're not going to take any risks if you know that there is a price to be paid. How do you build trust considering that it has been strained and seriously strained in large corporations? Well, you know, there's little things. There's a famous story about Jack Welch. Welch, when he was head of GE, uh, kind of got known as Neutron Jack because he was firing people left and right at the beginning. Uh, but then he got remarried and sort of discovered uh, humanism and, um, <laughs> and uh, now he's on his third marriage, by the way, but that's with an ex-editor of the Harvard uh, Business Review. Um, and, and there's a story of him, uh, of him throwing a party for someone who tried something and failed. In other words, what he was saying is that was a good attempt. You, you, know, you did what you could. And we don't only reward success, we reward risk taking. But if you only reward people who succeed and you fire people who failed, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if, if uh, Welsh would have been prepared to run a, have a second party for this guy. But, <laughs> but, uh, but certainly a first party uh, he did. So you know, there are things like that where you send out a message saying we respect reasonable risk taking. Uh, and we respect people who know what they're doing. But if the chief executive thinks he's got or she's got all the knowledge, uh, then you're in big, big trouble. If you don't mind, we'll take a, one of our first tweets. Um, how do you teach our leaders to demonstrate ethical leadership? You were talking earlier about compensation and the outrageous amount of money that has been paid in the last 20 years to CEOs. Um, I guess if they're taking that much money, the word ethical doesn't really cross their mind or after. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously you can start with bonuses. That's the first place to start. Uh, I'm concerned not with the illegal corruption, uh, because when people get caught, they go to jail. I'm concerned with the legal corruption. Uh, executive bonuses are a form of legal corruption. Uh, and, and you see it horribly in those big banks in the U.S. and insurance companies where people were paying them huge amounts of money months before the company mm. was going into the verge of, of bankruptcy. So, so I'm concerned about, about legal corruption. I think another form of legal corruption is all the lobbying that's going on where corporations are so aggressively lobbying governments and, and, and money in the political process, which in the U.S., in Britain, they kind of keep it out to a great extent, but, but in the U.S., it, 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 it's a horrible situation, and that's legal corruption. When, when a company says to me, we want to be socially responsible, my reaction is good. Start by getting out of my government. Get out of my government. As individuals, as individual owners, as individual shareholders, you're a citizen like me. As corporations, you have no business in government. You know, uh, corporations are defined in U.S. law as persons. Uh, so, so, so what we have is the, is the companies are persons and the persons are human resources. It, it's a kind of wonderful situation going on. Um, I think companies aren't persons. Com obviously companies are collections of persons. The persons who make up or own the company have every right to do what any other citizen does as long as they don't throw their money around as long as they're not able to throw their money around in the political process. Um, but, uh, but they should, uh, but, but the lobbying that takes place is, is, is horrible and it's getting worse and worse and worse. It's killing the democratic process. America does not have uh, democracy, to my mind, the United States, so much as what I would call individualistic democracy. Before I talked about the individual level, the community level, the collective level. And a healthy democracy balances individual rights, community rights, collective rights. Mm -hmm. uh, America is so tilted towards individual rights that it's undermining their very sense of democracy. 
in the United States. And sense of community as well, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny because de Tocqueville wrote about America as, as a place that was, had such strong sense of community. But that's been depreciated 200 years ago. That's been terribly depreciated. Could you